this past Saturday, Canyon Molitor and Eroy Ashley, men who had never met, got into an argument online. They decided to take their dis disagreement to the next level and met at the King Food Mart in St. Augustine. This time the argument was verbal and turned physical when both men drew weapons and began shooting at one another. Canyon Molitor, 25 years old, died at the scene from multiple gunshot wounds. Elroy Ashley, 30 years old, died four hours later at Florida Hospital Flagler from gunshot wounds he received in the gun battle. This past Wednesday evening, family and friends of Eroy Ashley gathered at uh, Calvin P.D. Park to pay their respects and held a candlelight vigil. While there, Kenesha Singleton said that although she and Ashley didn't always see eye to eye, she respected him because of his devotion to his children. As a father, a father of four girls, they were his world. They really were. It's so hard. He loved his kids. He absolutely loved his kids, Singleton said. My baby's four years old and she knows that her daddy is with the angels and stuff like that, so it's hard. We all have young girls, all of his kids' mothers. And he did have a big impact on their life, so it's not like he's going to be forgotten. He will live through his kids. Are you kidding me? What in the world could make two grown men, men who had never met before, believe it's all right to go meet someone you've had an online, online argument with and then solve that argument with a gunfight? Then when they both lose and both are killed, what makes one of the men's three baby mamas believe that he is in heaven with the angels? Have we totally lost connection with reality? Is there no truth in the world anymore? How can anyone be so blind? I believe the answer to that may be found in the 25th chapter of the book of Isaiah. So I invite you this morning to open your Bibles and turn there with me. Isaiah chapter 25. As together we look at the problem and the cure for mankind's ills. Isaiah chapter 25 and we will begin in verse 1. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have accomplished wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. For you have turned the city into a pile of rubble, a fortified city into a ruin. The fortress of barbarians is no longer a city. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, a strong people will honor you. A city of violent people will fear you. For you have been a stronghold for the poor, a stronghold for the humble person in his distress, a refuge from the rain, a shade from the heat, when the breath of the violent is like the rain against a wall, like heat in a dry land. You subdue the uproar of barbarians as the shade of a cloud cools the heat of the day so he stills the song of the violent. The Lord of hosts will prepare a feast for all the peoples on this mountain. A feast of aged wine, choice meat, finely aged wine. On this mountain he will destroy the burial shroud, the shroud over all the peoples, the sheep covering all the nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face and remove from his people's disgrace and remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth for the Lord has spoken. On that day it will be said, look, this is our God. We have waited for him and he has saved us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation for the Lord's power will rest on this mountain. But Moab will be trampled in his place as straw is trampled in a dung pile. He will spread out his arms in the middle of it as a swimmer spreads out his arms to swim. His pride will be brought low along with the trickery of his hands. The high-walled fortress will be brought down, thrown to the ground, to the dust. What an exciting chapter this is for the Christian. Isaiah, with prophetic foresight, is able to look into the future and see a day when fantastic things are going to be happening for God's people. 
There are so many great things foretold in this passage that it is difficult to decide which one is the greatest. So many terrific things that God has done and will do in the future. For one, we are told in that day, the barbarians will be subdued and their song will be silenced. Look there again, if you will, in verse 2. For you have turned the city into a pile of rubble, a fortified city into a ruin. The fortress of barbarians is no longer a city. It will never be rebuilt. And verse 5, like uh, heat in a dry land, you subdue the uproar of the barbarians. As the shade of a, cool, uh, of a cloud cools the heat of the day, so he steals the song of the violent. Can you imagine what a comfort these passages have been for God-fearers in the past and what a comfort they are for God-fearers and Christ followers today. Can you imagine what a comfort these verses were to Paul as he sat in chains with a Roman guard shackled to each arm? Can you imagine the comfort he got knowing that someday that great country defeating people, enslaving, God-denying, Christian, persecuting nation of Rome would fall and Christ would be exalted? I can almost see him sitting in the gallery of heaven looking down on earth as scores of Roman soldiers once charged with arresting Christians were baptized on their way to battle. I imagine this passage continues as an encouragement to downtrodden Christians today in North Korea, in China, in Egypt, Turkey, Syria, and throughout the Middle East, even today. To know that someday those who have been your persecutors those who have lived high and mighty while attacking and mocking your faith will be brought low. I don't know about you, but I look forward to the day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is a great thing. And I look forward to that day. But I don't believe that's the greatest thing we see in this passage. Look there again, if you will, please, in verse 6. The Lord of hosts will prepare a feast for all the peoples on this mountain. A feast of aged wine, choice meat, finely aged wine. The Lord will prepare a feast for us one day. I remember when I was young, I went to a... When I was young, in my early 20s going to get to me in a minute. <laughs> I went down to a business luncheon in Orlando. And at the time, it was held in one of the fanciest hotels in town. I remember walking into the lobby of that place. The lobby was open for several stories. The, the front of the motel was glass all over the place. Escalators going here and there. Flowers and plants everywhere you look. Beautiful place. Now, for a country boy who didn't go to the city any more than necessary, it was a big deal going to that motel. And at the luncheon, we were going to hear Terry Bradshaw and Paul Harvey. Now, the tickets, now remember, this was in the 80s. The tickets were $25 a piece. Man, in those days, you could get the best surf and turf at some of the nicest restaurants for that price. So I figured at that price and that location with those speakers, this was going to be some kind of meal. Imagine my disappointment when lunch was served and I discovered that it consisted of one little old plate with half a pear on a leaf of lettuce, a roll, a wedge of tomato, one strawberry, and a scoop of something sitting there that I never did figure out what it was. I didn't know if it was tuna helper, chicken helper, or turkey helper, all I know, or turkey salad. All I know was there was meat and mayonnaise piled in a scoop sitting there. Disappointing. Man, for $25, I could have gone to Waffle House and gotten one of everything on the menu and left full and fulfilled. Amen. I could have it smothered and covered and diced and everything else in the world. I left hungry that day. But my friend, heaven will not be disappointed. For in that place, the Lord is going to have a banquet prepared and waiting for those who are invited. 
at that banquet there will be choice meat and finely aged wine. The best that was ever prepared by the chefs at Ruth's Chris Steakhouse will sit with silent mouths after tasting what God has prepared. Oh, I've eaten with folks in Russia where a typical meal was hard bread and soup or a few small boiled potatoes and rubbery fish. I've eaten in Haiti where many people are rail thin. Some of the children do not start wearing clothes until they are four or five years old because their parents cannot afford any for them. And where some of the children in the Christian school there served a, a scoop of rice with some flavoring in it in a paper plate will eat half, fold up the rest of it in their paper plate to take home so that they will have something to eat that night. Can you imagine? Sitting at the Lord's banquet with a Russian sister on one side and a Haitian brother on the other side. The Lord says in the future, in my house, at my table, you will not know hunger anymore. For I have prepared a mansion for you and a table you will not believe. I look forward to that day. And that is a fantastic thing. But it is not the greatest reason to celebrate that I see in this passage. Verse 8 we're reminded of another. He will destroy death forever. He will destroy death forever. Oh, can you imagine? When death is destroyed once and for all. Ever since Adam and Eve first sinned in the garden, the shroud of death has hung over us all. In this passage, though Isaiah with prophetic vision says that on this mountain, the shroud of death will be destroyed. On this mountain. And let me tell you, my friend, there was some battle that took place on that mountain. On that hill called Calvary. The devil pulled down all the stops trying to make sure that our Savior would be destroyed and that he would stay in the grave forever. He had one of Jesus' close associates betray him with a kiss. He sent a spirit of fear on the disciples so that they would abandon our Lord. He had Jesus convicted though no crime was ever committed. Can you imagine someone being crucified who never stole, who never committed any crime or led any rebellion, and someone who never encouraged anyone else to break the law. The devil saw to it that he was sentenced for being king of the Jews. And then that accuser of the brethren, he strengthened the hand who held the whip and he guided the hand to plunge the spear into our Savior's side. When Jesus was buried in that borrowed tomb, the devil saw to it that a stone was rolled in front of it and that the stone was sealed to never be reopened. He posted guards in front of the door to keep our Savior in. But after three days, he rose with the keys in death and hell. For the grave could not hold him. Low in the grave he lay. Jesus, my Savior. Waiting the coming day, Jesus, my Lord. Vainly, they watch his bed. Jesus, my Savior. Vainly, they seal the dead. Jesus, my Lord. 
For death cannot keep its prey. Jesus, my Savior. He tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord. For up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lived forever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. Oh, my friend, one day death will be completely done away with. And I am excited. But that is not the most exciting thing I see in this passage. Verse 8, we're reminded of another great thing that God will do. Verse 8 says, He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face. On that day, every tear will be wiped away. Can you imagine what that will be like when Jesus wipes away every tear? The tears of the widow who will never be lonely again. The tears of the sick who will never know pain again. The tears of the orphan who will never be unloved again. The tears of the poor who will never be unclothed or hungry again. The tears of the bereaved parents who will never lose a child again. The tears of the guilt laden who will never have to live with regret again. On that day, he will wipe away the tears from every eye. Oh, I look forward to that day. And what a great day that will be. Well, there'll be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more grief, no more death, and no more goodbyes. For death and the grave will be destroyed for all eternity. So many things to celebrate in this passage. Oh, but I believe the greatest thing we find in this passage is recorded in verse 7. On this mountain, he will destroy the burial shroud. The shroud over all the peoples, the sheet covering all the nations. In the King James Version, we read, And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people, and the veil that is spread over all nations. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14, we read, But their minds were closed, for to this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. It is not lifted, because it is set aside only in Christ. Oh, my friends, ever since he began lying to Eve in the Garden of Eden, the devil has blinded the eyes and the understanding of mankind so that they do not see and understand. This veil of Satan, the blindness that he brings on so many people, is a terrible thing. What is it that makes young children first pick up a cigarette? Believing that somehow their ending will be different than their grandparents who finished their lives sucking on oxygen from a tube. It is the veil of Satan. What is it that makes people, even older folks, begin experimenting with drugs? Believing that somehow they won't get addicted when all around them there are people pushing shopping carts and living in the woods as a result of their drug addictions. Somehow believing that they will be different. How can they believe such things? How can they be so blind? It is the veil of Satan. What is it that makes people believe that fame and money and possession will bring joy and happiness? When Robin Williams, Elvis Presley, and Muhammad Ali show that it's not, it is the veil of Satan. What is it that can make two strangers who meet online get so bent out of shape that they're willing to meet at a convenience store to continue their argument and end up killing one another? What is it that can then cause one of the men's children's mothers to believe that she will see him again in heaven? It is the veil of Satan. And sadly, this veil is still at work today. Tom Brady star quarterback for the New England Patriots referred to this right after winning 
his second Super Bowl ring. Reporters excitedly asked him about how he felt about winning this tremendous honor, not once, but twice. His response puzzled almost everyone in attendance when he dejectedly replied, Somehow, I thought it would mean more than this. A handsome, gifted athlete with a supermodel wife, money, fame, millions of admirers and adoring fans and accomplishments galore, including several Super Bowl rings, learned that nothing this world has to offer will fill that hole in your heart apart from a close relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The greatest thing I see in this passage is that God will destroy this veil and allow us to see the truth. Oh, I remember as a 19-year-old young man sitting on a balcony in Monroe, Louisiana, the balcony of my ninth floor dormitory, with a half-empty bottle of rum sitting between me and my friend, a roommate, trying to figure out which path we wanted to choose, which path we wanted to follow. You see, we had grown up in the church. And we had enough of the Lord and enough of church upbringing in us that we weren't happy in the world. But we'd been messing around in the world so much that we weren't really happy in church. And sitting on that balcony that day, we contemplated which way we wanted to go. Because straddling the fence is miserable. And I praise the Lord that on that day he opened this young man's eyes. That he destroyed the veil and allowed me to see the truth. That nothing this world has to offer can compare to a relationship with Jesus Christ. That nothing this world has to offer will fill that void, that emptiness in your heart, apart from a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest thing that God has done, the greatest thing that He continues to do, is to open our eyes. And to allow us to see the truth. To allow our children to see the truth. To allow our family to see the truth. And my friends, God is still doing that work today. He did it for Bob Williamson. Bob Williamson was born into a family with a mom who was an atheist and a dad who hated him. His dad adored his brother, worshipped the ground that his mother walked on, never could understand why his dad hated him so much, though later he began to suspect that he thought it was because he believed, uh, his dad believed that another man was his father. Unloved and un unwanted, he began drinking at 13. Was an alcoholic by 14. Then started drug use. To support his drugs and to buy his alcohol, he began stealing. Was convicted, put in jail. After coming out, he was drafted into the military during the Vietnam War. If there was anything he hated, it was the military. Eventually, he was booted out of the military. The psychiatrist, psychologist, said that he would become a serial killer 
He had no emotions, no feeling, no empathy at all. After getting out of the military, he moved to Atlanta where he began dealing drugs. He would physically collect bad debts. Hearing that the police were offered after him, he left and went to New Orleans where he began doing the same thing down in the French Quarter. There his violence, his anger intensified to the point where he had a reputation there in the corner. Hearing again that the police were after him, he fled once again, went back to Atlanta and continued a life of crime. He later reported he had never known a friend, never had a friend until his thirties. Unloved and unwanted, finding no joy in the bedroom at the end of a needle or at the bottom of a bottle, he decided to commit suicide. Why not? His father had, two of his cousins had, his brother had. Perhaps he could find some release there. He decided that he figured out the perfect drug cocktail to take to commit suicide, but it was quite costly. It took him a while to save the money. In the meantime, one night he got drunk, borrowed a friend's car, and, and had a, a head-on collision with a, another automobile on the hospital. Uh, on the highway, placed him in the hospital, severely beaten up and broken, bored to death. An older grandmother, black nurse, there in the hospital, a woman taking care of him, took pity on him. He was bored to tears, trying to find something to read, something to fill the time. She brought him her Bible. He was not a Christian man, cared nothing about religion. But after all, this is the best-selling book in the world. He decided he would read it just to be able to prove it wrong. He found the Old Testament boring. And then he started reading the New Testament. And he heard about Jesus Christ. A man who hung out with the prostitutes and the thieves. And loved them in spite of themselves. He began to be attracted to Jesus. Until he got to that passage of scripture where it said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He got angry, took that Bible, threw it across the room, hit his buzzer, called the nurse, told him to get that lying book out of his room. For there was no way that he could change, that Jesus could do anything in the life of a man like him. Nurse came picked up her Bible off the floor from across the room, ginger, gingerly brushed it off, and after calling him a few select words, said that if he was able to strengthen her in spite of her physical ailments and give her the power to keep taking care of her grandchildren and keep coming to work and keep providing for her family day after day after day, then he could save his sorry ass as well. <laughs> picked up the Bible and prayed and on that day his life was changed became a multimillionaire an entrepreneur the founder of more than 25 businesses one that he sold for 45 million dollars because Jesus Christ opened his eyes my friend Jesus is still doing that today. And perhaps he has done that for you. I want you to know that there is nothing in the world you can pursue. <clears throat> nothing that you can chase. Nothing that you can find that will bring you peace and joy and fulfillment in your life apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you this morning, you need to say, Lord, please, Forgive me. I've been living a life of my own doing what I want to do. Lord, would you please forgive me? And when you come into my life, when you come into my heart today to be my Lord and Savior, I need someone new at the helm. And some of you, oh, you did that a long time ago. And you have no doubt that if you were to die today, you'd spend eternity with the Father in heaven. But somewhere along the way, <clears throat> 
you've gotten distracted. You've gotten off the path. And instead of following the path of righteousness, you've instead turned and chosen to follow a path of your own. You're no testimony. Your life is no witness to others. Anyone looking at you would not want the Christ that you profess to know. Perhaps this morning the Lord has opened your eyes and said there needs to be a change in your life and in your heart and your priorities. Would you this morning say, yes, Lord, please forgive me. I want to be your man. I want to be your woman. I want to be that godly mother, that godly grandfather that you called me to be. I want to make a difference. And I want to be able to say to my neighbors and my children and my grandchildren what Paul said to those that he taught. The things that you've seen and heard from me, you do these as well.